pleasure of visiting Tina Howe, one of the great women of letters. Tina is one of the great rhapsodic lovers of language. Her language is almost symphonic. I just think she writes children and families with such an incredible ear for this domestic chaos. So it's so particular, I don't think anyone does it like Tina. I first met Tina in my 20s and she's suddenly appeared like a fairy godmother at pivotal moments in my life. She once gave me a little good luck charm, a little pink elephant for my first opening in New York and I still carry it with me to previews, openings. I should have brought it with me, it fits right in the palm of my hand. So good to see you. Golly, you're like Alice in Wonderland. I love this. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God, is this Paris? This is Paris. Paris in your, in your entry hall. I love it. And this is the Pont Neuf oh over the God. Seine. <laughs> and what I thought was that perhaps we could take shrink me pills and have our interview. <laughs> Right Let's on the pond, have it on the bridge, on the little thing, and that we could just sneak in there and Let's float away. Do it. Let's get some chocolate croissants and enter the dollhouse. Yeah. So here's the view of the rest of the world from from on high. It's your own private Paris. Yes, my own little perch where I can watch all manner of of human behavior in the summertime. Parties galore people dancing, clinking glasses, loud music. And so one feels that one is um, sort of living in the, in the thick of things. Um, it's, uh, and the water here. And the water out of the other window is, is a look to the Hudson and uh, New Jersey, which our son used to call Germany, and I never bothered to correct him <laughs> because I thought it's wonderful to have a child grow up thinking that he's living uh, you know, across the river from Germany. <laughs> so One also sees rather untoward um, oh. things from these windows, and there was a couple that lived um, like on the on the, on the eighth floor, who used to make love, violent, very <laughs> ac acrobatic love, right in front of the window. And there is a roof right next to the window. And a man used to come and stand on the roof, you know, a peeping Tom, and watch them. <laughs> and he'd get very excited watching them. And then there was another higher roof behind him. And another man used to show up on that roof, watching the man, watching the couple. And then I was behind them all, watching the whole panoply. But then I, I wondered, if, does this couple know that they are sort of creating a scene? And is this something they want, or, is, or are they innocent? And so I asked the super to give me the, um, you know, a, a number to call, you know, to, to, so we could notify this couple that they were attracting a crowd every night. And he, he gave me the number, and I, and I gave it to the super, and the next day, they were gone. Oh, no. Yeah. But pyrotechnics. I, yeah, over. yeah. But it was, um, what was so amazing was how it sort of involved the whole neighborhood, <laughs> the whole rooftop neighborhood was watching this couple. So do, do, do the rooftop pyrotechnics and all the stories make you want to write about them? Not on your life. <laughs> Not on your life. I only seem to write about what's in my head. Mm -hmm. And um, they can do whatever they want. They can jump around naked. They can bring in elephants and ride on them. But I'm not interested in them. I'm really not. It's just, to me, this is a refuge, just to be able to, to gaze out at this sort of um, 19th century view of all of, these, of, of all of these rooftops. Now, can I ask you, are these your friends on the radiator, old friends in terms of books, or are these, these things this you're is working Norman's, on right now? This is Norman's Norman. um, domain. My books are in uh, the dining room, which is the room that I work in. But this is, this is all of Norman's historical material, and this bookcase as well. Um, so this is his. This is where he works. He works in the bedroom. I work in the dining room. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is. If you live in New York, you, you know who can afford to have separate offices. So we do the best we can in these in these rooms. I'm interested to see what you see from the window that you that you write in, ah, that you write from. I will show okay. you. So this is your desk. This is it. This is the torture chamber. Oh my god, I love that you have this view of the water, but you but you write facing a brick wall. No, that's the whole point, yeah. If I faced the water, I would dive into it, and there'd be no, no recourse. But this way, uh, it's facing the brick wall, where nothing happens at all. The brick wall in Beckett. 
Yep, you got it. Oh, goody, you noticed. <laughs> My French postcard that says in French, um, when you're up to your neck in shit, all you can do is sing. <laughs> So I sing, this is where I sing at my desk, looking out. So do you write here in the morning? Do you have a, a little routine? I have a little routine, which is probably the same as yours, of any mother. You work <laughs> when the children are asleep or at right. school. Yeah. And that's, where, that's how we learn to do it. And I think that's what makes us so disciplined, mm. more disciplined than the fellas, because mm -hmm. we know we only have so many hours before they come back from nursery school or before they wake up from their naps. Mm -hmm. So it's always um, nine to three for me. Mm -hmm. For you, it's probably seven till <laughs> noon, if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, 10 to two, just about. And I do look out on the water, and it's terrible because I just gaze at the water, and I think I might need to relocate to the brick wall. Yeah, or you put up a picture of the brick wall in front of the, <laughs> in front of the window, you have a brick wall. So maybe rather than standing around my workplace like statues, maybe we should sit down and I should accommodate you. Sure. Okay. Let's sit. This is where the mommy sits, and this is where our son used to sit. Oh, really? So that you can be my favorite son. <laughs> so I love that you write in the dining room, and I felt like maybe this is cheap, but I feel like I have to ask you about the art of dining and food in your plays. There's such luscious imagery of food in your plays. I think the reason I work in the dining room is because um, it's the biggest room after the living room. <laughs> and there was no other place to put a desk. Yeah. The truth of the matter is I've always been rather afraid of food because, um, as I wrote in The Art of Dining, mealtime was really about being entertaining. And my father would have just finished doing his broadcast at CBS of the evening news, and he would come home to have cocktails with my mother, and then we would eat after Daddy had done the evening news. So he would go over what had happened in the evening news, and my mother would tell stories about her day. And then it was my turn, and my, me and my brother, to be entertaining. And so um, I found it very difficult to, to be funny and charming and eat at the same time. <laughs> and so I usually played with my food, and then invariably was sent from the table for playing with my food. And I think the reason I wrote The Art of Dining was I wrote it in the 70s and I noticed that eating had become a mania with people, eating out. And the eating out was almost more important than going to the theater. And I thought, if I could set a play in a restaurant, it would be sort of an uncanny coup <laughs> to, to suddenly have the audience watching people eating and behaving the way they behave over a meal. But the play really comes from... Um, Elizabeth's point of view, the frightened diner who is having a meeting with a publisher who wants to publish her work. And she can't eat and talk about her work at the same time. And so she starts, you know, first she drops her lipstick in the soup, and then she starts talking about mealtime, which was essentially what mealtime was like in my household. And that has always been my favorite play. I know it's not my best play or the most, doesn't reverberate the most, but there's something about seeing that frightened young woman trying to get through a meal and trying to talk about her art at the same time and making a terrible mess of it, ending up on her hands and knees, you know, because she's wearing somebody else's glasses, trying to make her way to the ladies' room. But truth be told, um, I'm not a very good cook. <laughs> and my poor daughter, when I'd make a meal, I would say, get out of the kitchen, mommy's having a nervous breakdown. So that she, I didn't pass that on. You know, I'm not one of those women with an apron around her, tied around her belly that makes wonderful pies and cakes for her daughter and teaches her those things. I'm just, so in a way the dining room is perfect for me because it's not in the kitchen and um, I'm making words, I'm not making meals. So the dining room actually has always been the place of imagination for yes, you, in yes, a sense, as yes. opposed to eating. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned your father and mother and how your dad worked for CBS. I mean, was was his, was his he very theatrical? Was that one place you got your sense of theatricality? No, that all came from my mother. My father began in broadcasting. He began working at WQXR, and he also wrote the news. He, was, um, he wasn't simply a broadcaster, he was a commentator. But he was a, a very kind of mild-mannered, um, small man, much smaller than my mother. My mother towered over him, and he was shy and something of an introvert. 
and he lived very much in his in his in his mind. His mind was always whirling around. But my mother was very tall, and it wasn't enough that she towered over him. She also wore her hair in an upsweep so that it was on top of her head, and she had a permanent wave. And then she'd wear a hat on top of that, <laughs> and usually the hat had adornments so that it made her, you know, like six feet tall, and he was five, six. <laughs> and she was very theatrical. And um, in the summertime, because we were New Englanders and you don't spend money, we never had air conditioning. And so in the summer, she'd walk around in her slip and her hat, um, and carrying on and, you know, having martinis before dinner and sometimes before lunch. And so um, I got this this sense of, of the absurd and, um, and also of grandeur that to be a woman isn't simply being a mother or, or being a wife, but it's also being a performer in a certain way. Mm. And so I think if you grow up with an eccentric like that, it, um, I'm very much, physically I'm her child. Um, I think the how tendency to work and work and never stop working, I get that from my father, but I'm this unfortunate blend of, of the uproarious and the, and the serious, and that's what keeps getting me in trouble, uh, <laughs> trying to mind my P's and Q's and write sensible plays, and then my mother's sort of wild anarchistic streak um, kicks in. Well, thank God. I, I love what you say about getting the sense of the absurd from your mother, which I think is something I share with you. But I think you also get the sense of absurd from Ionesco, right? Yes, I, I do. To... But first, I want you to tell what you grew up hearing, what your mother was doing <laughs> as you were growing up. You must tell, you must tell me that. My mom used to recite that speech from The Bald Soprano, the, the maid speech about I have one blue eye and I have one brown eye. That used to be this mantra. She'd like come into the kitchen saying, I have one, and my real name is Sherlock Holmes. I have no idea why. It was one of her favorites. Can you talk about Ionesco and absurdism and what that light bulb was that went off when you first saw him? I come from a family of writers. My two cousins, Susan and Fanny Howard, eminent poets. My grandfather... Uh, won a Pulitzer bi for biography and was writing verse into his 96th year. My father, aside from writing the, the news for CBS, wrote a trilogy called A World History of Our Own Times. His sister was a novelist. So all the conversation at dinner time, when I couldn't eat, was about being a writer. And I always wanted to be a writer and took writing classes, you know, at Sarah Lawrence before I graduated from but there were so many words to choose from that I was a disaster, and they made a rubber stamp worse than the class, and <gasps> they write on my forehead. And the time came to write a final thesis project, and I didn't know how to handle language. There were so many words, and I decided, I don't know what gave me the idea to write a play, and I had never studied playwriting. I had never really read that many plays, but I just knew if you write a play, you don't have to worry about the words. It's just what happens. And so I wrote this very pretentious play about the end of the world uh, that featured a king and a queen and a lot of pigeons on, on step ladders uh, spouting nonsense. And it was, it was terrible. And Jane Alexander um, was the leading actress at Sarah Lawrence at this time. And she read it and said, I want to produce it. And then the leading lady got sick at the 11th hour, and so Jane not only produced it, but starred in it. Mm. And because it was a pretentious little play about the end of the world, it was a huge hit, <laughs> you know, at Sarah Lawrence. And everybody clapped and yelled, author, author. And so I ran out on the stage and began throwing kisses. And, and because it was such a success, I thought, ah, well, this is the kind of writer I should be. And so after graduation, my father said, I will either send you to graduate school f for a year or to Europe. You know, that's, <laughs> I mean, it was just an obvious choice to make. And so I, of course, um, decided to go to Paris. And in the course of that year, I began writing my first full length play, you know, the great American play, never having studied playwriting, never having, having read anything. Anyway, the point of the story is that um, Fred Morey, the English actor said, um, would you like to see Ionesco play with me? And I had never heard of him. I didn't know who he was. And I said, sure. And so we went to the tiny, you know, Théâtre de la Huchette. And there were, there were this Mr. and Mrs. Smith looking very Camille Faux and very proper, just as I had grown up with these very literary people, although my mother wore these hats and 
walked around in her slip. And it was played very dead on, very serious, you know, that they, you know, on a mangé bien ce soir, on a mangé du, you know, pommes de terre au lard, des poissons. And they did it completely straight faced. And she's going on and on about her day and their husband won't listen. And then the guests come, they come on, you know, they come four hours too late. And the play is really about very proper English people trying to have a social evening together and trying to behave properly and the language flies out of control, but yet they soldier on, and they, and they soldier on with great sort of class and determination. And the audience is in hysterics because, um, because their language is so ridiculous. And I am in hysterics, waves of laughter in this tiny theater that you can hardly breathe because it's so overheated, laughing and laughing, and, I, and, I, and it was like lightning going off in my head, realizing, finally, a realistic play. <laughs> It was so familiar to me, sitting around talking about world affairs or talking about this or that, because my father would take me to E.E. E. Cummings' um, readings at 92nd Street Y, but then he'd take me to the palace to see the roller skating midgets and to see all of the, you know, the various acts. And there was always this split and the Marx Brothers that was a huge part of my upbringing. So that Every weekend we went to the, see a Marx Brothers movie and we knew them by heart, my mother, my, my father, and my brother and I. And so it was that fusion of the anarchy and the joy of the Marx Brothers and this very high-minded sort of um, reading and literature and my father could recite poetry. So then to see The Ball Soprano and to see how Ionesco fused the ridiculous with the, with the real and with the... Um, and with something social, these people trying so hard to, to pull it off at a successful evening and being unable to, it was just huge. Mm -hmm. And I walked out of the theater realizing this is what I have to do and I am UNESCO's spiritual daughter and my role in life is to bring the same sort of uh, helium and anarchy and joy to female experience that he does to you know, social experience or male experience of, you know, identity and where you belong and, and what's proper and what's socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. And that I wanted to do this, you know, in terms of, of women's experience. I tend to give long answers. That's great for me. <laughs> um, and you met him, right? I met him, but I was expecting a, uh, a more buoyant human being because his plays are so funny. And in fact... He was a very depressed little man, and his wife was even smaller than she, than he, and and she would carry. She had these huge shopping bags from Galerie Lafayette, that I think was sort of filled with the food that he had to eat because she tasted all his food before giving it to him, and she seemed that she was taking very good care of him. I was beside myself with excitement to be meeting him, and was struck dumb. I couldn't speak. I just gazed at him and was beside myself. Um, and then I had him sign my book and he said, for Gina. <laughs> it was so UNESCO-like that he doesn't know my name and he doesn't know that I'm his spiritual daughter. But um, I don't think I've ever asked you about your religious upbringing before, but I have this quote from you about grace, which maybe I'll read to you. You said, I'm a hopeless optimist. It's so easy to go to the dark side, weeping and tearing of flesh. It's much harder to find grace. That's always my goal. Did you mean that in the religious sense or the aesthetic sense or both? I think more in the theatrical sense. Mm -hmm. I feel that I have a tremendous spiritual longing and I'm waiting for some minister of some church to, to put his or her hand on me and bring me into the fold. It's something that I, that I long for. My brother has become very devout in self-realization fellowship which is a form of yogi, and he meditates um, for four hours every night. Oh. And he's gotten very thin and, and pale. And he um, has a PhD in classics, so he's a classical scholar. He teaches Greek, or he used to teach Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit. And he's translated Augustine, and he's translated some other early church fathers. But I feel that there is a huge spiritual part of me that is begging to be found. Um... I think the reason people go to the theater is to be consoled, you know, be, to be educated, but also to be consoled. And so if you can paint some 
desperate or lurid or bizarre or painful situation that your characters are struggling through. And if by the end, if they can find some sort of resolution and or grace and or transformation, I think that's the whole reason that uh, that's what the audience goes, you know, that's what the audience wants and that's why they come to the theater. And I've always felt that that, that was kind of our obligation. and. And it could be because I'm a more optimistic sort, but I think it's very easy to pull the plug and have the character die or to have him kill somebody. But I think it's much trickier to figure out how the characters can go to the next level and how they can transcend. And so that's something that all of my plays have in common. And I think it's because I, I inherited my father's optimism. And, um, and I, but I also think that's what the audience wants. And I, and I know that there are many writers who have made their career by not giving what the audience wants and by ending on the dark side um, with explosions and with blood and gore and the gnashing of teeth. But um, I, that's not what I do. I think it's very rare in all kinds of literature to see um, the mother's point of view. We see a lot of mothers represented. And we often see mothers from the son's point of view. I mean, I think of Amanda. But when do we hear the mother speak? And particularly, do when do we hear the mother speak when she has small children? Mm -hmm. And I knew that um, when I wrote the play, I had, um, I had my son or my daughter was on the way. Um, and so I wanted to show the sort of exhaustion and also that thing of being baby drunk that mothers have when they have a new baby that they just go berserk and are, mm -hmm. you know, cooing to them and talking baby talk to them. I wanted the child to be larger than life because of, of how exhausting they are, but also how adorable they are. And so it made perfect sense to have the baby be played by a large man. Mm -hmm. And so the first time around, we had an enormous fat man, a bald fat man, and, and, very, and very sweet. And so that in the first scene, when he runs in too soon to get his presents, and, and his mommy stands back and looks at him and says, oh, my Nicky, you're such a big boy, you know, and the audience screams with laughter. But, um, but he's a big boy because he looms so large in her heart, you mm -hmm. know. And, and I've, always, I've always loved that play because, um, because I think it's full of imagination. And I think critics get confused about what's imaginative and what's absurd. And mm -hmm. if you get too imaginative, mm -hmm. then you're accused of being mm -hmm. absurd. And so mm -hmm. my first play was about how women compete in courtship situations. And in that play, in one of the scenes, she takes off all of her clothes and jumps into a wedding cake and is licked clean oh, by the man that she hopes will marry her. Mm -hmm. And Clive Barnes said, of the 10 worst plays he'd ever seen in his life, that the nest went right at the top. <laughs> And a week later, I had my second baby. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, my feeling was, you think this was mischievous. Honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and my, my, and my innate feeling was, come on, it's high time that, that a woman really wrote about female experience and, and not in a, I wasn't angry. I wasn't an angry mother. I wasn't a resentful mother. I was a besotted mother. Who loved, who dearly loved her child, and would would be exhausted by them. But, and I felt it's high time that an audience come into a theater and see young children. You mm -hmm. know, because this is part of so much part of a life. I mean, you have your young children, and whoever puts them on the stage. And I felt, as a UNESCO spiritual daughter, that I should put them on the stage. When you, when you compose your plays, are you composing musically, rhythmically? Oh, very much so. Today happens to be Bach's birthday, and I am this major Bach freak. Um, and in the in the early days, and I was completely besotted with Glenn Gould, who's very percussive. His piano playing is is ecstatic, but very percussive. And I would, in the old days, when I had records before CDs, I would get the first side of Book One of the Well Tempered Clavier, put it on the record player, and play it, put it on repeat, and play it for four months over and over and over again. And then after four months, I'd flip it to the second side, and there were six records. So the musical beat is there, and, that, and that's always very important to me. Um, I mean, something that people never talk about when they talk about playwriting is the writing. Mm -hmm. Yes, why don't they? Because it's so ephemeral. And I remember, you know, I teach at Hunter College. I've, I'm, I'm playwright in residence of this new MFA in playwriting. 
And I'm, and I'm often so tempted just to have a couple of weeks where we talk about how do you handle language, mm -hmm. you know, and to me, repetition is so crucial mm -hmm. in, in, in writing plays because we, we tend to snag on words and say the same word over and over again. And there's something comforting about, uh, you know, about repetition, you know, both visually and orally. And so I think it's, it's really important to make writers aware of how in, in normal speech we do repeat ourselves so much. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of my writing about, you know, family or something, um, children, I do try to think of, of how they speak, but I'm also, I'm also very mindful, of, I mean, this sounds so pretentious, of, of sort of putting my plays together in a musical way, and so that I have movements where, you know, I have adagios and I have, you know, lentos, and I'm, I'm very aware of that. It's, it's very, it's very important to me, you know, when, when an aria breaks out and when, um, and when there's dead silence. Um. I want to go back to what you said about uh, people don't talk about playwriting as though it's writing, which fascinates me. And I have a theory about it, and I think it's partly that if you talk about playwriting as writing, then, then actually the writer is the authority on the play. Whereas if you talk about plays as stories, then anyone in the room is an authority on the play. So I think it's a way of taking the authority Ooh, away from writers. And I think it's very bad. And I also think it's a way of taking a writer's major tool, language, away yes. from them. So I was teaching class um, the other week at Yale, and this writer brought in a beautiful play. And I said, did you know that you're writing an iambic pentameter? And she had no idea. Wow. And I, I mean, I, I loved that she was doing it unconsciously, but I also think we don't have that training right. anymore in our programs, these sort of tools that Shakespeare had. The I am, the spondy, you know, all these all these linguistic tools for different modes, different moods. We don't have that. We just have one guy in the back of the room saying, "You need a clear arc." Right, right, right. Which right. anyone can say right, right, and right. anyone can do. Frankly, it doesn't require a lot of expertise. It doesn't require that you be a writer. The writing comes first for me, and you can tell in the first two or three pages whether there's a there's a voice, where there's a, a new voice and a, and a, a voice that demands to be heard. Um, and when it comes to story, that's really easy to take care of because all you have to do is say, you have to remember that plays are about what people want. So be sure to give your characters a want. And that's easy to do, but you know, the writing is something else and you can tell immediately um, if, they, if they have an ear and if they um, are moved by the, by the lapses and by the excesses of speech. I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, but I never went to graduate school. I never studied any of this, so I don't even know what a spondy is. <laughs> it sounds like an Italian dessert or a flavor of, of gelato. I'll have a spondy, please. And what is a spondy? It's a little insect? Mm -hmm. Oh. As opposed to I am. You know, it's like it stops you. It's like spondy. Oh. It's like what Glenn Gould does. Glenn Gould has a lot of spondy. Oh, man. In fact, Glenn Gould's name might be a spondy. Glenn Gould. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. You said that when you wanted to write plays, it was partly because you didn't, you couldn't choose words, which I find sort of unimaginable, but that you, Elizabeth Bishop once said, I write poetry more by not writing it than by of writing course, it. Of course. And it seems like that's what you're saying about writing plays, that there's a kind of subtraction. Oh, yes. It's what you don't say, always. I think it's it's what is it's what isn't said that is always um, the most thrilling. I'm a huge admirer of Harold Pinter. Mm -hmm. I, I think oh I think his plays are so gorgeous. I think they're just stunning. And I often um, have the class we read the first scene of Betrayal mm -hmm. with Jerry and and Emma. It's just like oh there you are. I'd like a drink, would you? I thought I saw you last week. Did you? Oh, I thought of you. I thought of you. No, you did. Oh, man, just kills you. And I think if I could write a play like that, that simple and that complicated, I would love to do that. Sometimes I think there are two kinds of playwrights, ones who love writing the first draft most and ones who love doing rewrites most. Well, I have to rewrite 
it's not that I love it. I, <laughs> I have to do it. Oh, the first draft is always is always hideous. Um, no, and you know, and in teaching, I think it's really important that you that you have your students do several drafts. I think that's it's all about that. It's all about cutting because the more you cut, the more you reveal. So. You said the first draft is hideous. Why? Oh, it's such a mess. It's so it's all over the place, and it has no symmetry and no balance, and it's overwritten and it's embarrassing and it's just disgusting. No, no. What we, about the experience of writing? Hideous too. Yeah, because you know how bad it is. You know that it's all over the place, and you want it to be. I mean, I'm. I'm sort of sick in this regard. My students ask, how do you begin? And I'm the kind of person that I can only go to the second scene after the first scene is perfect. So I'll spend a year on the first scene, going over it and over it and over it until it's just, you know, like a polished hope diamond, but which will take a year. And then I, and then I start the second scene. And, you know, oftentimes it takes six months to do the second scene. And I so envy the writers who sit down and can write a big sloppy draft. I always feel like my first scenes are horrible. No matter what I do, it's like, um, you know, Wittgenstein's ladder, like you have to climb up the ladder and then hoist it up in terms of language, like that the first scene is some horrible ladder that had to be written and that actually it's impervious to rewrites. I'll try to go back, but that's the way the play began. But I find that almost invariably my first scenes are very hard to stage and I'm not fond of almost any of them. So you do draft after draft? Yeah, I do. What I, I, I suppose I do one, I do a quick draft sometimes of the first act, and then I take a big break, and then I write the second act. But I might take a really long break before I know what the rest of the thing is. I mean, do you take breaks in between? No, no dogged. Okay, dogged. Dogged. So it takes me at least two years to write a play. How, for you, how long? About two years also, yeah. I mean, if you get stuck and don't feel like writing, will you take a break, or will you? No. No, if I'm stuck and don't feel like it, I beat myself. <laughs> no, take a break. I don't deserve a break. I've failed. I have failed, and I have to keep failing. And I stay there, and I make it worse, and I keep at it. It's humiliating. <laughs> you don't do that? <laughs> no, I, I guess I don't write if I don't feel like writing. But, um, I mean, in the old days before children, I might go to another country or I mean that would be my advice to go on a road trip drive to another country go you know take some serious time off don't don't look at the problem head on wait until you can look at it obliquely but now that I have kids yeah they're when kind you have kids you can't do that so you have to go and suffer and fail right I mean speaking of having kids how did you balance motherhood and, and writing. I, mean, I find you very inspiring the way you raise kids and continue to write I remember you visited me just after I I'd had twins and I was feeling a little desperate about not writing. And you sort of said, well, it's a very short amount of time before they go to school. It's only yeah. a couple more years and then, you know, you'll have this time. What I always tell young women is when you have a baby, you rejoice in the baby for a year and a half. You don't even think about writing because babies are so fantastic. Um, and I remember how baby drunk you were when you had Anna. Yeah. I mean, they're just unbelievable. They smell so good, and they're so bald, and they're so pink, and they're just fantastic. So that you you roll around on the floor with them for a year and a half, because how could you miss that? And then once they're a year and a half, then you get a sitter, and very gently, you know, two hours one day, and then eventually you go three days a week for three hours, and then maybe four days a week for four hours because, you know, as I said to you, once they are um, in nursery school, then they're gone from 9 to 12 or 9 to 1. That's a lot of time to have. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt that women, because we have, you know, those of us who have children, because of that, we really learn how to use our time. So, you know, like a clock, even though my children now are big and hairy and have children of their own, um, it's like... Oh, they've gone to school. And so when I get up, it's like, oh, the children are in school, so I can go to my, my typewriter. If your whole life were the theater and trying to write, you know, wonderful plays that everybody would love and get good reviews and run forever, you'd kill yourself right. because that just can't happen. But when you are able to come home to your darling babies at the end of the day and, they, and they're so happy to see you, it's huge. I feel that in some fantastic way that women can have it all, and that 
I mean, the other thing, I think because we learn to be very disciplined and, you know, when I was growing up 7,000 years ago and you think of writers, you think of F. Scott Fitzgerald and people that would go on drunken benders and look for their muse and Hemingway and they'd go and bullfight and do all of that and go, go to Fiji and have drink endless bottles of rum to find their muse. But I think women, we can't do that because we can't leave our babies. And because we can't do that, we find resources within ourselves that maybe we didn't know we had. Um, I was very happy to see your Obi. And I wanted to talk to you about another award that you've been involved with called the Lily Award um, that I got one year that is for women playwrights. And I was wondering if you could talk about how it came into being and any thoughts you have about what, what the Lily represents in terms of uh, what women playwrights need to be doing right now. I got an email at... 2.14 in the morning, the day after the Drama Desk nominations came out, an email from Teresa Rebeck saying, why, oh, why weren't there any women nominated for a Drama Desk award when at least 50 productions were by women? I don't understand this. We have to do something. And she sent it to uh, Marsha and Julia Jordan and a few other um, sort of angry female playwrights. Um, but dear old Marsha Norman, by nine in the morning, had emailed everybody back saying, why don't we have our own award? Mm. Why don't we have our own ceremony? Because there are a lot of women to celebrate. And that seemed a marvelous idea because it wasn't something coming out of rage or upset. It was coming out of the desire to celebrate. And I think, f I think for us women, it was very important to, um, to band together and honor ourselves in terms of our work. So it wasn't... Even though it was gender-based, the, the women that we were celebrating as women, we were celebrating because of their work, because of the kinds of plays they were writing or the kinds of, of performances they were giving. I've always felt that, that we haven't begun to be heard from as women. And yes, it would be nice if women had more productions, but I, I believe that there's this new crop of, of women playwrights, certainly including you, who are stretching the form and who are examining life and art and family in, in new and, astonish, and astonishing ways, and that this is just the beginning. <laughs> this is where I keep my obi, <laughs> and there it is. I was very happy to get it, but it ended up in the storeroom. <laughs> Below that is an honorary degree from Whittier College, which means I'm a doctor and I can prescribe drugs. Along with my awards is this creation. I bought five pairs of these, and I wound them all up, and I put them on the sofa, and so I had 10 of them singing in chorus with their cheeks blazing. My children thought I had gone insane.